Welcome to Lily Dart. Thank you. Um, yes, we. Is my mic on? Can anyone hear me? No? Okay, let's do that before we do anything else. Yeah? Good, cool. Um, so, yes, uh, yes, this is the first time. Uh, so, I've been a contractor in government for a very long time. This is the first time I've been allowed to talk about a project I've actually worked on because uh, usually I can't get permission. As a civil servant, I can get permission. Um, but uh, there may be some questions, if you have them, that I may not be able to answer because there are certain things uh, that it's difficult to talk about. But on that note, what I'm going to talk about today is what user experience can learn from service design. Um, so I used to be a UI designer, I was a UX designer, I'm now a service designer, and that's kind of been the arc of my career. So I want to talk a little bit about what I've learned over the last couple of years um, that's kind of led me into service design. On the assumption that my clicker works. Which it doesn't. Cool, all right. So service design, if you haven't come across it before, is a holistic, user-centered approach to designing services. Many organizations are now switching their focus from UX, particularly in the uh, public sector, towards service design in order to build uh, a deliver and design better services for their customers. So good service design often encompasses five things. The first one is a focus on meeting service user or customer needs. So what will make the user want to use the service or if they have to use it, how can it be made as simple, as intuitive as we want it to be? Sounds a lot like UX so far, right? Well, the second thing it thinks about is it considers the end-to-end -end user journey. Um, and now, I say end-to-end, -end, and I really mean end-to-end. -end. All too often in large organizations, we design interactions with our users in silos, handing off users to different departments or mediums like phone, website, or in person, without really considering what their overall experience might look like when they come to the end of that journey. So the third thing we also think about is staff user needs. And again, occasionally UX will touch on some of this, but often not quite into the depth that service design will consider it. And we do this with the acknowledgement that if we don't give staff the tools they need to do the job, we can't possibly deliver a good service. We also design for business processes. So we're getting into kind of business analysis a little bit here, considering what information the business needs, how we can make business processes as easy and efficient as possible, as well as how the whole organization can work better together to deliver a better service. And at that point, we're talking about organizational design as well. And finally, good service design, like good UX, is measurable. So we prototype, we test, and we design metrics, even when we're prototyping things that are physical services and not digital ones, to make sure that our experience is a good one for our users and to ensure that the service is going to perform in the way that we want it to. So what is the difference between UX and service design, really? Well, UX generally, and I'm going to say generally because I know there are a lot of people doing UX in amazing, really profound ways, but generally it means we only cover the elements of a digital experience. We don't often cover the true end-to-end -end nature of a real user's journey. So let's look at an example. If we take this example partial user journey for a cleaning service with online booking, we can start to see where some of the gaps might arise if we have purely a UX focus and not a service design one. So traditional user experience only accounts for about half of the touch points in this journey, the highlighted ones. And that's because only half of them are actually digital touch points. And some of the other points are digital, but they're not directly within our control. So they don't get covered by traditional UX. So let's have a look at what is actually needed to make this service function as a whole on each of these touch points. So if we start with the first point, for a user to have seen an advert, we must have had someone design that advert. Marketing, branding, and someone has to go and get the ads actually printed. So that's the first point, right? We've got marketing, branding, print design, three things that usually we don't touch on in UX. If our users are likely to search for reviews about our service once they've seen an advert, then someone needs to be thinking about incentivizing our users to review us, um, engaging with users on social media to head off complaints and to build rapport with existing users. Again, sometimes UX might cover it, sometimes not. 
At the point in which the user hits a website, then we're safely in UX land for a couple of steps. They'll sign up, they'll book an appointment, and those are fairly straightforward transactions. But as soon as that appointment is registered on the website, someone needs to be thinking about fulfilling that actual appointment and making sure it happens. So this then means CRM systems. It means you know, having and hiring staff. It means having HR systems to manage their time. Uh, it means scheduling, because if we don't schedule it, then no one's ever going to get to the appointment. Then for the cleaners visit, we need to make sure that they can actually get to the venue and that when they can get there, they can clean. So someone needs to be thinking about transport and the supplies that they're going to use when they get there. And finally, after hopefully a job well done, we might need to take payment. So we might have written the code for this, we might be using Stripe or PayPal, but someone needs to be thinking about where the money goes next, doing the bookkeeping and making sure our staff get paid. So what's the impact if we start to remove some of the back-end considerations from the journey? What sort of things break? Well, if our branding is poor or misleading, we won't get the users in the pipeline to actually sustain the service getting money at all. If we don't have functioning CRM and HR systems and a way to reliably schedule appointments, then the cleaner never turns up. And if we don't know how much money we've taken or pay staff incorrectly or forget to pay them, then they won't turn up next time. We'll also have less appointments for users because we've got less staff. So next time the new user coming down the pipeline can't actually book an appointment. So these are critically important. I think we've established that. But who actually designs these elements, these business considerations? Well, usually they don't get consciously designed. They evolve as the need occurs, often with each specific team in an organization specifying the product that they want to do the thing and the problem that they have at the time. And this is inevitably going to create a fractured back end. And that, as we can see, will inevitably create problems for our users, even if they're not quite this extreme. So the point of service design is that we consider all of these elements in a service, and it's a big job. But Assuming that I'm not trying to change your job titles and move you from user experience into service design, what are the core things that user experience designers might be able to learn from this approach? Well, today I'm going to cover off three different areas. I'm going to talk about designing truly end-to-end -end journeys. I'm going to talk about designing for staff. And I'm also going to talk about designing for organizational strategy. Now, these are three areas that, in my experience, we often miss out on when we focus on products rather than journeys and transactions rather than experiences. But today, I'm not just going to explain why these things are important. I'm going to walk you through a real life example. Now, this example is actually an example of what goes wrong when you design for the technology, when you design in a UX space rather than a service design headspace. And it's a real government project. Um, my team has been working to fix it for the last year. Um, and it's important to note that we're not there yet. This is still very much a work in progress. But we have made good progress, um, so I'd like to share a bit of that with you today. So let's talk about great.gov.uk and export opportunities. If anyone here is a big fan of exporting, then you're going to love the next 20 minutes. <laughs> so export opportunities, it now sits on great.gov.uk. Um, it provides curated tenders and sales opportunities for UK businesses to sell their products and services around the world. Um, it's a centralised source. So Great.gov.uk, which we've now moved it into a part of, is a centralised source of tools, guidance and support for UK businesses who want to sell goods overseas. Now, when we launched it in 2015, export opportunities didn't have the great.gov.uk wrapper around it. It was a standalone website. And it launched to support the campaign, the marketing campaign, Exporting is Great. So this was not only approached from a kind of UX perspective um, by the digital agency who built it, but also very much from a marketing standpoint. Now, the campaign was and is an excellent campaign. It, you know, it's an award-winning campaign. It did a fantastic job of uh, bringing people to the website, converting people uh, in the transaction on that website. Uh, we, there were radio and TV ads that drove you know, thousands and thousands of people to the site. So initially, everyone was absolutely, you know, they, were, they were super happy about what they'd done. It, it was a fantastic campaign, and it was very successful. And the campaign still is very good. But when I joined the department about five months after this uh, 
kind of website and campaign had launched, attitudes had started to sour quite badly. Some users were unhappy, a lot of staff were frustrated, and the first task that I was actually given when I joined was basically to have a look at this, this thing that had been created and work out what was going on. Now, I had a look for a couple of weeks and I identified that there were three core issues. The first was that although we had a fantastic conversion rate on the digital platform, the effort that users were putting in to apply for tenders wasn't really bringing them much back. So they weren't winning as much work as we were expecting them to. The second was that the written quality of the tenders that are sourced from across the network was quite poor. Now, the content of export opportunities is sourced from government staff in posts and embassies and kind of other international standpoints around the world, where we've got our network of people out there talking to businesses in market. None of them are trained content editors, and often English isn't their first language. So users were finding opportunities difficult to understand, and the staff sourcing them were getting extremely annoyed with us at head office as we were trying to force them into more and more process to improve the content quality because it slowed everything down. Finally, and most critically for us as a government department, we didn't know when we were helping businesses to win work. We knew we were, and we knew they were winning enough of it to make the service worthwhile. We had just about enough data to verify that, but Identifying those people was hard. It might take up to 18 months or more after the digital transaction had happened to actually get a confirmed sale. So the lead time on it was crazy. And most importantly, users had no reason to inform us if a sale was successful because we'd already helped them with the bit that they wanted help for. So let's have a look at each of these issues in detail and how we reacted to them. The first was businesses that applied often weren't winning any work or they weren't winning as much work as we hoped they would. So there were three, again, core issues that we found were happening when we looked into this in a bit more detail. The first was that businesses applying weren't export ready. Now, this means that they didn't understand the complexities of selling abroad or they had no strategy as to which country they wanted to sell to or they weren't ready to negotiate with a different country or culture. Now, the second one was that, no, we're still on the first one, cool. Um, so this is a journey map describing the end-to-end -end process for exporting into a new market. We call it the export caterpillar because it looks a bit like the hungry caterpillar, yeah? Um, it's extremely complicated and it's got many points where businesses, if you can just about see it, might drop out the process. Um, so there's a high level of risk with this because it is time, so time-consuming uh, and, and complicated. A lot of people start and then stop. So what we were doing with the original version of this service was we were putting businesses who had never exported before, um, dropping them into the service at this point, and then we're kind of like forcing them to jump over this bit to get to this bit, straight to a negotiation. And we were concerned that as a result, we were becoming a negative trigger because a lot of the time that wasn't working out for them. They weren't prepped, they weren't ready, they didn't know all the things that they needed to do. Um, and when things went wrong, they weren't sufficiently prepared to deal with that. So the second issue we had was if we posted an opportunity for a construction company, we'd just get the wrong people applying. So instead of getting construction companies, we'd get digital agencies responding, wanting to make websites for construction companies. Uh, so there was a real issue with kind of clarity of what the service was about. Some of the companies that responded also weren't British, and um, specifically that's a requirement of, of working on the service. Um, so all of these misapplications were also confusing and kind of bumping up our conversion rate a little bit. It looked like we were being more successful than we were, when actually we weren't getting the right people down the pipeline. Finally, users quickly gave up using the service, to be quite frank. Um, the process of winning work could take over a year, it could take 18 months even. So it wasn't a quick fix or an easy task for a business wanting to grow. That combined with the fact that not many applications yielded results meant that users were quickly dropping off from using the service. And in fact, we only had about a 25% return rate. So we decided to do three things after a lot of research, prototyping, and um, other things of that nature. The first was that we launched great.gov.uk, the wrapper that now sits around export opportunities. Previously, export opportunities have been a standalone service with almost no content about how to export or what it looked like when your business was export ready. 
So great.gov.uk um, offered a much more encompassing offer. There was a clear user journey for new exporters. I'm not sure you're going to be able to see any of my uh, screenshots. It's a bit fuzzy, sorry. Um, it provided straightforward guidance on the steps needed to get export ready. So it was really about getting people ready up to the point that they could use export opportunities. We also expanded the potential to gain business leads when you are export ready. Um, so things like, can you get onto an online marketplace like eBay to sell your goods? Um, can we get you directly in touch with another business so that you can start to network even if you're not quite ready to sell yet? Um, not just the tenders that Export Opportunity provides. And this was a much better fit with people who are in earlier stages of the Caterpillar because we were helping to guide them through the points. So before Great Duck After UK, on the Caterpillar, this was our service coverage across a new exporter's journey. We were doing a pretty lengthy job of it. This is now what it looks like. We have some support of some kind across every step of the process. So we're no longer asking people to skip steps or dropping them out of the process without support. So the next thing we did was pretty controversial at the time, and we made a decision to make it harder to navigate on the website. Or rather, more specifically, we made a decision to make it harder for new users to get to export opportunities. And we did this to encourage them to go through the great.gov.uk content to really understand what export ready looked like and not hit a service that they were not ready to interact with before they were in a good place to do so. So we did this by uh, creating a content triage model. We asked users to self-identify as new to exporting, occasionally exporting, or regular exporter, taking them on a different content journey depending on how they identified themselves. So the journey is heavily created by us. It gives you options depending on where you are and what you might need to know next. Most importantly, it doesn't take you to anything that is lead generation tools like export opportunities and still you've, until you've gone through the whole journey and are hopefully at that point export ready. Now, it's a really blunt tool at the moment, um, but the qualitative research that we have has indicated that you know, fewer not ready exporters are applying for export opportunities. So based on the success of that, we're working on a much, much, much more advanced version that will proactively ask the user questions up front about their business so that we can diagnose their export readiness and where they might specifically need help. And this will then offer a properly customized, per user customized journey to guide people through the site and get them to lead generation tools when they're ready. Finally, we redesigned multiple parts of Export Opportunities itself to make the tender process clearer. The biggest redesign that we went through was the landing page. Um, this was the old landing page. It has a confused call to action with multiple interactions available. It doesn't set any expectation of the process once you've applied for an opportunity. And there's really no clear service proposition, like why do I want to use this thing anyway? So we've relaunched the landing page, and it has a quick call to action in the form of a search. It's got a clear value proposition about what a user will gain from interacting with the service. And it's got a quick overview of the process actually involved. So what we're doing here is we're setting clear expectations about what will happen if you apply for an opportunity. But we're not just setting expectations about the transaction. We're setting expectations about the service as a whole. So since launching Great Dog UK and with uh, some of the other improvements we've made over the last six months, we've increased the amount of returning users by 25%. So this gives us a strong indication that users are getting less frustrated uh, with the service as it stands. Uh, they're not dropping off as quickly and they are finding more value in it. So what did we learn? Well, we learned that good conversion rates do not make for a good service. Conversion rates lie. The conversion rate for the digital transaction was amazing, but it was just that. It was just for a digital transaction. It was completing a form. The service hadn't been designed to support users throughout the whole journey, and hence it was failing quite badly. So conversion rates lie. The written quality of the tenders was poor and hard to understand was our next problem to solve. So export opportunities are sourced, the actual tenders that we write are sourced by staff in international posts and embassies. We've got over 100 embassies sourcing. We've got 200 people who are actually editors within that. We've got 205 opportunities being posted per week and over 1,000 live on the site at any given time. So this is a service run massively at scale in an extremely ad hoc way, or it was previously. So none of the people who source are content designers or copywriters. Many of them don't have English as their first language. 
Co to combat this originally and the quality issues that it brought up, we set up a centralised publishing team and head office. Now, actually, a lot of these people weren't professional content designers either, um, which didn't really help things. But we had three or four people in head office checking opportunities and trying to edit them for uh, improvements before it went live. So this is what the process looked like. Um, we had uh, opportunity sourced at the embassy. So someone would go out, talk to someone, find an opportunity. We would then get it written up by the embassy. Um, it would be uploaded to the publishing platform, but not put live. Uh, it would be reviewed by us at head office. Um, almost certainly, we would then send back a bunch of feedback going, this isn't good enough, to the embassy. They'd have another look at it and edit it. It would come back to us. Uh, we'd review it again. We'd decide that it still wasn't good enough, but yeah, it's probably all right. Uh, we'd then edit it again, and then we'd publish it ourselves. So how long, does, uh, how long do you think that took, that process, to get published? Anyone? Two, two weeks, two months? OK. So 40 days. Average of 40 days to get something that is that big, a piece of copy that is that big out the door. Uh, it was horrendous and everyone hated us and that was valid um, because we were slowing the whole thing down. Uh, many of the tender opportunities also are time sensitive. So that means that actually by the time you've gotten to 40 days, it might be that you can't post it anymore because the tender's already expired. So this is a really big problem, not just for our staff, but also for our users. So they, uh, they hated us, it was valid, um, uh, and the faster we tried to publish, so we tried to do things like going, let's just go faster, we'll throw more people at it, it will be fine. Um, the more we tried to scale it, the more the kind of problems leaked out in other ways. We published lower quality, um, we had new people coming in who didn't know the process, it wasn't a sustainable way of approaching it. So what was the impact? Well, opportunities were hard to read. They didn't get responses, or more likely they got responses from the wrong companies because they didn't make much sense. Uh, opportunities didn't get enough responses in time to make a, a deal. So they weren't live for long enough. Um, e you know, even if we did manage to get them live before they expired, they weren't live for long enough for enough people to be able to apply for them. So it wasn't resulting in wins for UK <coughs> companies. And staff were frustrated and disengaged with the process. So if they could get around not using the platform, if they could get a, business, a win for a UK business by some other methodology, they would do that. They would skip it at every single point. The only reason that they carried on using it was that they were targeted on how, much, how many opportunities they would upload. Um, but they didn't really care whether or not they got an outcome from that. They just had to upload them. So we did three things. Um, the first one was the improve the current editing process. So this is not a digital process at the moment. We do hope to uh, build this into the app at some point, but it's been a bit of a journey just trying to work out what the process should be. So this is an entirely non-digital solution. Um, well, except for like Google Sheets. But uh, We improved the current editing process and added an SLA. So the new process looks like this. At the point at which an opportunity hits head office, we triage it into green, amber, and red. Green has a final check and clean up at the office and then goes straight to publish. Amber generally has too many quality problems. So we send formalized feedback from a senior content designer. So we've put a professional content designer in the team now uh, back to the embassy to say what we'd like them to do. It's important that we send feedback back at this point rather than just get the content designer to fix it because A, we don't understand the context and B, we want to be able to upskill the people at post to understand what has gone wrong. Red is just not fit for purpose. Um, it's either not an opportunity or it's not an appropriate opportunity for the site. Um, so we send formalized feedback and just reject that outright. So what has that meant? Well, by re-engineering just the process, and I'm genuinely meaning just spreadsheets and the order in which we do stuff, uh, we've ter reduced turnaround times from 40 days to, if you get, give us a green one, 24 working hours. Um, at most, it will be about six days if you give us an amber one, or that's kind of the average if we have an amber one. Now, the way that we've done this is by triaging based on um, kind of either ends of the spectrum. So you can either say, let's, get, you know, let's do the stuff that is most time critical. It's been with us for the longest. Or you can say, let's do the stuff that is like, easiest to publish. And what we've done is we kind of tried both of those models, and neither of them worked. So we combined them to say, the stuff that's most time critical, we'll do that. The stuff that is easiest to publish, we'll do that. And if you come in amber in the middle, 
then you're not showing that you're playing ball with us. You're not showing that you're following the style rules. You're not showing that you're listening to us when we say we need it to come in a certain format. So you get put to the back of the list. The fact that we does that frees up all of our time for almost everything else, so it's still a lot speedier. But what we're saying is, this is your incentive network to do it in the way that we want to. So that turnaround team is reducing over time because we are getting more and more green opportunities because of this. We're sending more professional and constructive feedback and doing the thing to incentivize the staff to get it right the first time. So that traffic light system rewards people who create green, ready to publish ops. And it deprioritizes the opportunities of staff who haven't. So to ensure that we were being fair when we did this, we didn't want anyone to feel like we, were, like we weren't loving them or that they, were, they couldn't see what was happening in other posts because they don't have much visibility about that. We built reporting into the application. So this is just a really early stage MVP, but any content producer across the network can see the published time and the amount of opportunities published from any other region in the world. Now, the published time obviously has a direct relationship to the quality of opportunities provided. So hopefully we're also encouraging a bit of competitiveness into the embassies to up their game. We're also looking at other things about how we can automate content quality analysis by using things like Fleisch Kincaid, if you've come across it before, uh, to plug that into the dashboard as well. So finally, we decided to trial a trusted publisher model. So where embassies regularly write green and high quality opportunities, they will be given permissions to post directly to the live site because they've shown that they can be trusted. A trusted publisher means that we can skip most of the arduous process involved in the editing process. And head office stops being a single point of failure. So we can skip straight to publishing. Obviously, if we'd started with this, then we would have had uh, even more quality problems than we have at the moment. So to ensure this works at scale, we need to make sure that staff have the right skills to become trusted publishers in the first place. And we started doing this by making sure we have a professional content designer working with them, sending them feedback regularly. But we need to go a little bit further than that to really do this at scale, to really outsource it. So inevitably, it needs to start with training. Um, and we'd hope that this training is in person and tailored to the team that we're talking to. But with our 100 embassies, it's not scalable for us to individually go and train all of them. We've only got one person who works on training. So the benefit of individual tailored training and being able to get out there and see someone face to face is that you not only create expertise, but you also create relationships with people who are then going to understand what you do and the way that you do it. Once you have those few trusted people, you can then create a community around it where those who have been trained can share their knowledge. So it's somewhat of a train the trainer model and create new support, the creation of new content creators. So the impact of this is that you know, rather than saying we're going to try and do this at scale, we're going to do this all personally, we'll do it ourselves. What we're doing is creating a positive influence, a kind of ripple effect. Um, where staff hated us before, the staff experience was really poor, they didn't like dealing with the service and they hated us. If we can get this model up and running effectively, we know that where we've trained people before and where we've started to bring them together in terms of talking about what they do and how they do it, that it starts to ripple out positively across the network. So it's not just these staff that have a more positive view of us, it's also everyone else in the organisation that it starts to penetrate to. So you create just those few advocates and those people will speak on your behalf to other people. And that's really important when you've got an organisation of like 2,000 people, right? Because you can't always be in the conversations where people are saying that, that you're not the best at what you do. So the key point here is that not everything can actually be solved digitally. While we might use digital tools to help build communities and train people, the issue here is very much cultural. It's one of skills and engagement and, and capacity about coming together with a shared focus about how we're going to do this and how we're going to solve it next. So what did we learn? Well, we learned that effective services are run by well-supported staff, both in the digital tools that we provide them and in the support systems we create around them. We need to actively design the tools that they need to support an effective service. And sometimes those tools won't be digital. So, third problem. When a business had one work, we usually didn't know about it. We knew people were winning work, but identifying those wins and you know, something we have to do as government is assess the economic impact of a service and overall value for money. So that was really hard and it was you know, verging on impossible because we just couldn't reliably uh, identify where people were winning as a result of interacting with our services. So what was the impact? 
Well, we couldn't tell the organization how successful export opportunities was. We did know it worked. We knew it was getting positive outcomes, but we couldn't say for sure how many or of what value. And this meant that regularly and quite rightly, we were being challenged as to the value of the service and whether or not it should continue to exist. We couldn't identify which kinds of opportunities were most likely to be successful because we didn't know which had resulted in outcomes and which hadn't. And this meant that the massive network of staff that we had working to create them couldn't be enabled in the most effective way to bring the most value to our users. And we also couldn't identify problems that businesses had with actually winning the work. So because we couldn't see what was successful and what wasn't, we couldn't identify opportunities to unblock difficulties in exporting across the country or in other countries. And that was a really uh, missed opportunity for the organization because you know, DIT is about being able to enable these things. So we were kind of gathering data, but not enough to do anything useful with it. And also, the organization was asking us for referrals to their personal, tailored, and human-based services. So, you know, you do digital en masse, and then maybe you go and get a personal advisor if you've got some particular problems. But we couldn't say who, where, or when actually needed any of those services, because we didn't really know what was happening. So we did three things. The first was that we built a team of data scientists, data science robots, no, data scientists, and a centralized data analysis platform. So we started with a series of multiple unconnected services, and now each of them were collecting data, often about the same types of users, but we had nothing that really allowed us to uh, report back on how they worked as a particular programmer's work to the organization. So we quickly realized that the only way to do this efficiently would be to combine all of the data sets. So we built a data platform. Uh, first, we imported the data manually just to test it out, see what data we needed in order to do the calculations that we wanted, and make sure that the proposition worked, that we could calculate what we wanted to. And then we built some nice APIs so it does it automatically. Now, that helped us to understand the movements of our users, but not to measure the outcomes. So we started by then plugging in the Export Wins database. And Export Wins is a really generic form that our um, staff use when they know that we have helped someone to export. So they, they register it, they put the value in, and uh, then that gives you the clear answer on whether or not we've uh, hopefully helped someone to win work. So this meant that we could not only track users through multiple services, what they've done and why they've done it, but it also could see whether or not that resulted in a win. Obviously, that only worked if we already knew, as an organization, about the win. So, we then struck a data sharing agreement with HMRC. Now, this has allowed us to identify when money has been paid to a business in a different currency. So, it's not perfect. Because it's a different currency, it only shows us payments from outside of the EU. Um, but we can, help us, we can help to use it to identify where we may have created wins because we can see someone interacting with our services and then we can see that they did their first export, for example, um, where we may have contributed or helped or been instrumental in someone winning a new business. So we tried uh, test versions of some of the early algorithms for export opportunities. Um, we had roughly 1,000 companies in the sample who had interacted with our services. And from that, the algorithm generated 411 leads. Now, we're still kind of working through exactly uh, how many of those are wins and how many of them aren't. But um, I'll, I'll give you a comparison number in terms of what the old methodologies uh, brought us in a minute. Additionally, we've been using automated surveys to get feedback on wins from users. Now, we're using these to also identify the wins that come from inside the EU, where we don't have the methodology for doing that right now, and verify some of those that we've gotten from the algorithm. So we started out by sending 6,000 emails to businesses who had applied for export opportunities on the service in the last year. And we did this to ask them what the outcome of their opportunity was. We cut the overall sample into three different tranches, uh, nine to 12 months, six to nine months, and three to six months since their application. And we did this because we wanted to find out when the best time was to ask someone the question, have you won work? When, when was it most likely to have worked? Um, the clear winner was the nine to 12 month period, specifically at 10 months, uh, it showed the maximum wins without losing our response rate too much. So what were the overall results? So we had 6,000 in three different tranches. Uh, we had a 23.2% response rate, which we were quite happy with. And of that, 10% had one business or had current, were currently negotiating with the company they hoped to win business from. So 
it's very, very early days yet with both of these methodologies, but from a 12 month period, automation has identified approximately 500 wins for leads that we can follow up and have a look at. The previous approach that the organization used uh, was surveys. Um, and that only identified six wins in a 12 month period uh, the last time they did it. So we're working on verifying all of these things, but it looks like um, the, the data science approach is, is really going to work out for us. Now, the final thing we're doing is we're developing a measurement framework that takes into account the journey, uh, the full export journey, and not just the win at the end. So, again, this is based on the export caterpillar, which tells us that we can't know for 18 months for sure until we've helped a business to win work. So what we're now asking is, can we measure some of these points on the way? So can we say someone's finalized their business export strategy, um, or they know what logistics they're going to use, even if they haven't started exporting yet? So what did we learn from this particular problem? Well, we learned that successful services are aligned to the needs of the organization. For a, with a user experience focus, we sometimes become a little bit overly fixated on user needs. And sometimes we do this at the risk of the overall strategy and what the service is actually trying to get to. We refine the experience, but not our outcomes. So the overall strategy here was being able to generate export wins. It wasn't transactions on a service, but that is what we had designed for. So we always need to be prepared to back the organization when they ask us to justify ourselves, right? And we need to have the evidence to hand that we're creating the right outcomes for it, or the organization will stop supporting the service. And if that happens, then you know, so does our funding and our ability to run the service go. So by identifying outcomes and starting to identify wins, we're now not being challenged in the same way that we were about the value of the services that we're running. So those are our three big problems and how we're on our way to fixing them. So what did we learn from service design overall? Well, when we were struggling to help businesses win work, we learned about designing truly end-to-end -end journeys. And we learned that a successful transaction does not equal a successful outcome for a user. The initial version of export opportunities was focused on the number of opportunities posted and the amount of applications received from businesses. And as a result, it really wasn't working for our users or our organization because that wasn't the outcome that we were looking for and it wasn't the outcome that users were looking for. The system had been designed with this much of the journey in mind but we now see that our work has to touch on every single part of the journey. So this is my section called, what would service design do? And next time you have a difficult problem, I want you to start asking yourself some of these questions. So what questions can we ask ourselves in future? What would service design do? Well, we can start by asking whether or not we understand what a good outcome for a user really looks like. For example, if I order shoes online, I can't be happy with my purchase until I'm actually wearing the shoes. Now, sometimes it isn't our responsibility to design for that part of the journey. But if we design our part of the journey without a full understanding of what will actually happen, inevitably we will make mistakes and we will set the wrong expectations. We can ask whether or not we know what's happened just before and just after someone completes a digital transaction. So what brought the user to our site or product and is their motive, what their motivation is? And if we're handing the user off to someone else, what will happen next in the journey and how do we set those expectations appropriately? We can also ask whether or not we know what a user experience is when they interact with other service touch points. So do they get conflicting messages? Is their journey somehow broken? Is the quality of their experience not being upheld the, from what we'd like from the digital service in every other part of their interaction? And what can we do about that? Or who can we tell? So when we were struggling to improve the, content, the quality of our content, we learned about the importance of designing for staff. We learned that services are driven by organizations. They are not run by product teams as much as we might like to think so. When I joined DIT, export opportunities were started with a single outsourced development team and a team of three publishers in the office and a project manager, and that was it. And no matter how user-focused our design and development was, it seemed impossible to fix the content quality issues. We were trying to think UX about it, and it wasn't the right approach. So in order to run this service now, we have an in-house team of developers, we have a senior content designer, we have training, engagement, and community building specialists, 
and you know, a whole network of people and digital specialists around it to engage, train and empower the network. And that's just for one part of great.gov.uk. It's also supported by every other product team that works on great.gov.uk. So we can't do this on our own, right? We need a massive network of people because we're dealing with a massive service and a massive organization that we have to turn the wheels on and a massive user base. So we also learn as a result, because we're trying to turn the wheels on a large organization that you can't demand culture change, you can only facilitate it. When you want to change the approach of a network of over 100 people, you are looking to change a culture. And that is the thing that underpins and drives the approach of any organization. And it's a big ask. So when we were designing here, we were designing business processes. We were doing organizational design. And those were the mediums that we needed to solve the problem. Because the medium shouldn't matter. The tools that you're using shouldn't matter when you're designing for outcomes. So once we stopped approaching the problem UX first, once we stopped asking what can the app do to fix this, we started to see ways to solve it. So what would service design do? Well, it could ask whether or not you understand, you really understand the needs and perspectives of the staff that interact with the service in the same way that you understand your users' needs. You can ask whether or not you know really what a good outcome for a staff member looks like. What is their incentive for interacting with this service? Or can we give them one? Can we make their lives easier? And most importantly, you can ask whether or not this problem can really be solved with a feature or website or app, because they aren't always the right tools for the job. Finally, when we were struggling to identify our outcomes, we learned about designing for organizational strategy. We learned that if you don't design for outcomes, you'll never be able to measure them. You will always struggle to identify the value that you're adding, and sometimes you might not add it at all because you haven't thought in advance about specifically what measurement you will use to prove those things. Data and insight doesn't collect itself. You have to design for it whether in your own business processes, and that might be by running regular user research or showing your Google Analytics stats on the wall, or through the way that you architect your applications and databases. You have to design for data collection. And in our case, the only feasible way for us to really understand the impact of our services was to spin up a whole data science team and do proper data science. But that was important. It was important to do it because we need to be able to validate that we are spending money on the right things. We still see a lot of awful, painful, and inefficient services and products. And it's tempting to not to hold ourselves to higher standards because of that. But if your service is um, uh, driven by the organization, which it will be, if you need funding, if you need staffing, then you need to make sure that you are ready and willing to evidence what you do to the organization. Because otherwise, without evidencing those outcomes, someone will eventually come and take it away from you. So what can we ask ourselves in the future? Well, we can ask whether or not we know what a good outcome looks for the organization and what we're doing that's going to add value. We can ask how long and how much money we have to meet that outcome. For us, we needed to get at least 18 months to get a clear sense of what we were doing, and we didn't set those expectations up front. And then we started to get challenged. Finally, we can ask whether or not we are collecting the right data to accurately measure those outcomes. Because if we don't plan for it at the beginning, we'll always be on the back foot. So service design asks you to think holistically. There are practices and methodologies that underpin it, but a single service designer cannot design for every aspect of service on their own, and neither can a single developer or a UX designer or a content designer. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of approaching problems. And you might even know it by other ways, other names, like systems thinking, or possibly just what good strategy looks like. But while many of us here may not have the power or formal authority to change the behaviors of a whole organization, to redesign the whole business end-to-end -end process, or to rebuild a service from scratch because it's not working, I think we can all use this principle and approach and the what would service design do questions to help us understand and solve more problems effectively. Fundamentally, it's about not thinking with a narrow view, not just thinking UX. It's about genuinely thinking holistically. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.